Okay, welcome everybody to uh, Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, thanks so much uh, for participating today. I'll just remind everybody uh, for Zoom etiquette that uh, we ask that you mute uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, Dr. Forster will present for about 30 or 40 minutes and afterwards we, we'd like to engage in a, in a group discussion. So uh, we encourage you to raise your hand and, uh, and, and uh, uh, ask your questions or make your, your comments. Um, so, so it's a real thrill to have uh, Dr. Alan Forster, the Executive Vice President and Chief Innovation and Quality Officer at the Ottawa Hospital, uh, Canada's largest academic health sciences centre, uh, present to us today. He's also a full professor of medicine at the University of Ottawa, uh, where uh, Dr. Forster uh, has had a very prolific career on research uh, on patient safety and quality improvement and did some seminal work uh, that uh, evaluated the incidence of adverse events following a hospital uh, discharge and, uh, and through transitions of care with over uh, 240 publications uh, in, in the peer-reviewed literature. He completed his MD at the University of Ottawa in 1994, uh, did GIM subspecialty training in Ottawa and a master's in epidemiology, and then did a research fellowship at Harvard uh, with uh, Dr. David uh, Bates. I've had the privilege of working with uh, Alan for over 30 years uh, from medical school uh, onwards. He's a kind, compassionate uh, clinician uh, and leader, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure we're in for uh, a real treat with his uh, presentation on uh, can you deliver high quality healthcare without a comprehensive health, health information system? And for, for those of you that uh, um, uh, we've had a chance to talk about this, you know, I won't hide the fact that I do have a not so hidden agenda to ensure that uh, we move uh, away from OASIS to a comprehensive uh, health information system. And during the discussion period, I'd like you to, to reflect on and perhaps comment and talk about what you're looking for uh, in a comprehensive uh, health information system. Uh, and as the Ottawa Hospital, the Ottawa Hospital, the MUHC is, is going to soon uh, release its strategic plan, a digital transformation is going to be a part, a uh, key part of the backbone of the strategic plan. So uh, what digital transformations are you going to be looking for uh, from the MUHC? So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to uh, John Forster. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Mark, and uh, thank you, everyone, for this opportunity to come and speak with you. Um, it, I'm going to speak about this topic uh, that Mark's asked me to spend time on, which is around can, can, answering the question, can you deliver high quality care uh, without a comprehensive hospital information system? And, uh, and, and before I get into it, though, I'd just like to start with a, a few sort of anecdotes. Um, and, 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 I, and I will say that just, you know, in my career, Mark, Mark said we've known each other for 30 years. In my career as a physician and as a, as a leader, I would say I've been scared, scared about my ability to deliver on my, uh, on my uh, responsibilities kind of three times. Um, the first time happened actually when I was an intern, and Mark probably doesn't remember this. Uh -oh. But but I was I was on call at over the Christmas holidays uh, as as you are, <laughs> and um, I had an old guy get brought in from he just came straight from the uh, airport. He flew in from Florida where he was going to spend the winter, um, and he had uh, a week prior had tearing chest pain ripping through his from his front to his back of his chest, um, and he had the weirdest murmur I've ever heard, um, and. Uh, I didn't know what it was. And, and so, as you know, it's, a, it's always worrisome to phone the senior resident. Mark was my senior resident on call that night and called him down. And neither of us were really clear as to what was going on. And it turned out he had a, a type A aortic dissection. And we, we were able to get him to cardiac surgery that night. And despite the fact that he was in his mid 80s and he had likely ruptured his aorta a week before he lived and, and lived for another 10 years, I happened to see him again going on. So that was one scary point in my career. Um, and, uh, you know, Mark helped me out with that uh, diagnosis. And so I've always looked to Mark as being one of those guys who I've got to try and help because he helped me out myself. Um, the second time that I was really, really scared in my life was uh, as, as a leader in, in healthcare was 
uh, when we turned on Epic um, in in 2019. We turned it on June at, at on June 1st at, at 4 a.m. Uh, and uh, it was uh, you know it was a big celebration uh, and. You know, immediately it worked. It came on. It was fine. But it was in the weeks that followed when, when you know, we had a number of physicians who were finding were struggling with the with the um, with with like the change in their practice uh, and all of the different workflow that was happening. And we had, of course, situations where there were some problems with the application when you turned it on. I mean, I think like in the grand scheme of things, looking back, it was it was you know uh, all kind of normal normal expectations. Uh, but it doesn't make it easier in the moment. Um, but you know, when you're working with you know 15 or 1600 different doctors and 15,000 staff, and you're responsible for care to a city, it, it can be stressful when when everything changes all at once. Um, and that was a pretty scary time. Um, the the third the third scary time was in 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 March and April of 2020 when when the pandemic hit uh and we had to you know do everything to ad adapt and, and change and, and make sure we were available for our population um and and I'll tell you the the reason why this third one is kind of related to the second one is because what saved us at that third one was really having epic available to us uh when we had to switch to remote work for a large number of people and when we had to re 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 uh, change to virtual care uh, and when we had to stand up things like, uh, you know, testing clinics and, and, and assessment clinics uh, or care in, in long-term care homes, having this platform, this comprehensive uh, hospital information system made that possible very seamlessly and, and allowed us to continue operations in many ways um, without having any any sort of questions. And so, you know, this third, this third story of, of having a, a platform that's available uh, really, I, I, on, on June in June of, of 2019, uh, it was it was something I was scared of. But by by um, by 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 March of the following year, within within 12 months, it, it, you know, it was it was it was viewed as a godsend, and, and really was something that we um, we cherished and, and looked at, at having as something that gave us great strength and capability through the pandemic. And and I would just say, like as we've gone on with the platform. Uh, while there was that sort of anxiety at the start, uh, it has become something that now has been where I would say there there is absolutely no doubt you can you can run a health system without having an information system that uh, connects things. And, and so, just going into this talk, and I recognize that there's you know half an hour. I want to speak for 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 no more than half an hour. I want to get three key messages. The, the first is really a comprehensive hospital information system is is necessary. Uh, but not sufficient to achieve health care's quadruple aim. So, and I would absolutely say that without having a hospital information system, you cannot, a comprehensive hospital information system that has core functions built in and connected to each other, um, you, you cannot dream of providing the best care to your population or to individual patients. You cannot dream of having um, efficiency to the optimal amount. Um, and you can't dream of having a work uh, as a support for your workforce so that they're in a modern a modern environment where they can do their work uh, without having um, to do a whole bunch of workarounds and 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 fear of error or duplication of effort. Um, so I would just say that having this platform is is foundational uh, to everything you want to do uh, as a healthcare provider. Um, and and without it, you you really are uh, going to be left it, with, with a lot of sort of wants. Um, the second key message uh, is really around moving uh, from your existing state. Um, it's not an easy move. I'll just say that. Like any time you change, uh, try to make a change in how you do your business, uh, it's going to be difficult. Um, but what you don't see right now is all of the, the, the inadequacies of your current uh, current uh, work because you've made allowances in your in your work. You've you've figured out your workarounds. Uh, you figured out how to communicate with with and make do, and all of those things uh, become much more visible when you go to the new platform. Um, and I think one of the things I'll just say is, as you, it's it's very easy to get caught up in the complacency of, of a of a of a system that's not working. And then the last thing is, I'll, I'll, and I've, I've kind of made this as a bullet. It, it's easier to buy than build, and and I will say that. Um, 
that th this is something that everyone wants to think that they can do. They can be the next um, Steve Jobs or or Bill Gates, but but it really doesn't happen. Um, it, it it happens very rarely that that kind of thing happens. And the, and the amount of effort required to not just first of all build is one thing, but then to maintain and keep operational as as, as technology evolves very quickly. If your main job is running hospitals or health systems, uh, you, you know, doing that on top of uh, like looking after an IT system, like and, and making it, you know, modern. Uh, while you're trying to run the health system is almost, I would say, is impossible. And, and that's being proven over and over again. So, so those are my key messages. Um, I will say that uh, it is something that you, uh, as, as you know, I, I want to make sure that this is targeted towards uh, clinic, clinicians and not just administrators. Uh, but, but what I would just say is, you know, maybe this ties together in a in a in a, a story that, like last week, my dad had to go into the emergency department at the at the hospital in Ottawa. Um, I, he went in early in the evening and he came home late in the evening. Um, the minute he left the hospital, I got a, um, a, a, a like an alert on my iPhone. Uh, the alert on, my, on the iPhone told me exactly what happened to him in the hospital. I'm a delegate. I'm a I'm a care delegate for him, so so I'm I'm, I'm Permit, I have the permission to see his health record, but but it had all of his blood work. It had the, the a, a clinical note from the emergency department physician. It had the treatment plan. That, it had the diagnosis and treatment plan and follow up recommendations for the family doctor, um, all written in language that you know a non clinician uh, could understand. Um, and and I would just say like from my dad's point of view, who, who used to be a family doctor and worked for many years. To have that peace of mind that he sees what's in front of him and what he has to do to look after himself, his peace of mind that his family doctor is going to get the information and be able to follow up on it, and that his son, who's engaged in helping look after him, has that, that, that is tremendously impactful. Um, and I, I think if you think about what, like, from the if you were the internist looking after that person, or if you were the family doctor looking after the person, or if you're the son or daughter of that person themselves, or if you had the condition yourself, why would we not want this kind of capability in your system? And should we not be going for that um, as, as, as leaders within the healthcare system? And, and I think, you know, I'll just say, we, we spend a lot of time talking about, about the uh, platform itself, the Epic platform. But I, but I think if you, if you fixate too much on the EMR uh, and the, the, that component, you forget that there's a whole bunch of other things you need to do uh, to drive your organization to the success that, that that we all want, right? Like, and we what we all want, I think, I think we all want the, you know, amazing patient experience and care um, at the top. We want amazing population health. We want our population to be healthy, and while at the same time we're creating a great environment for our providers and, and researchers to work within, and, and while at the same time lowering healthcare costs. It, my sense is that everyone wants those four things. There's not not too many people that it would argue against those as being that that's the purpose of the health system. Uh, ultimately, how do we get there is often debated. But but you know one one way of thinking about that is through this what, what's called the learning health system, and the learning health system has been promoted. I think you know for about the last fifteen years or so, as a way of saying look, it's not just a technical system we're talking about in terms of driving quality and driving performance. We really need to think about the Kind of the social technical system together, and it it, it breaks down into practice to data, uh, data to knowledge, and then knowledge to practice. So you know, pulling data from your system that reflects the work you're doing, um, translating that into knowledge by having interactions with with clinicians and scientists and other other experts in the field, patients, uh, translating knowledge into decisions, which then then become now the the new practice, um, and then. That practice gets instrumented, and, and, and people work in the in the system, and that gen, of course generates new data, and the cycle uh, turns. And and that's a really simple cycle, and it's one of those ones where people have you know it's it's, it's intuitive. What's within that circle is the things that I think you, you need to start thinking about working on the, the communities of interest. How do you clarify problems with systems thinking? Uh, creating critical reflection in the system and, and, and spaces for people to uh, to communicate and and, and, and talk. The, the shared decision making and how do you you, you know how do you move and, and collaborate together when there may be conflicting interests, and then the last is how do we how do we meaningfully go through change? How do we have a formal methodology for 
deciding what we're going to work on, implementing the change, evaluating the impact, and then and then how do we tie that into the research agenda? Um, and and all of that I, I would say is, you know, what I've talked about there is not really about the EMR. The EMR is a very important part of it, but without thinking about these broader pieces, you're not going to get the values that you want at the top. You're not going to get those outcomes. Um, and, and I would just say that ultimately below that, that, that sort of desire to create those processes, there is a, a piece of this, which is really working on, you know, how the social side of things, how, what, how is your organization shaped? What is the science that you're following? And that, that's the medical science, the clinical science. Uh, there's the technological side, which is really the data infrastructure and, and EMR policy around sharing data and making data available to people. The legal, like what are you obligated to do as an organization and your reporting relationships to the government and others, and then your ethical oversight and, and, and you know, where do you, you know, when you're doing, uh, when you're making process changes and you're evaluating, is that research, is it quality improvement, how do you, how do you frame those discussions so that you're not putting patients at, at risk uh, and, and not taking away their autonomy. Um, so those are, those are the components and I would argue that you can start working on, on many of these things uh, without having a comprehensive EMR. Having a comprehensive EMR really does help you resolve a lot of this because it becomes now a single platform. But I would argue that you cannot do anything unless you start working about this conceptually in terms of, a, of, of an overarching approach. So, so those are my introductory comments. I'd like to just pause for a moment to see if there's any questions or comments. And then I'm going to tell you how we got to where we got in our organization. And I, I don't know if... Uh, like uh, if that's a normal way of going about things, but I do think interspersing things is probably better than me just blab blathering on for 45 minutes uh, straight. So I'd love it if someone could ask a question. And I'll say hi back to Sasha. <laughs> maybe I'll just ask a question like, and, and this maybe is, um, you know, in your day-to-day -day work, uh, did, did some of the things that I, I mentioned about the background of an EMR and change uh, resonate? And do you see that there's a, an opportunity for you to improve uh, care uh, with, with an EMR? And um, maybe the other question I'll ask you, so do, do you see that opportunity? And secondly, what do you think is the strongest, uh, what, what do you think would be the strongest business case that people could put forward to make it happen? So Ariel is talking about the unintended, undesirable consequences. Um, you, you know, uh, you, you really do need to spend time thinking about those uh, unintended consequences when you go. Um, we had some, and I'll get to that a little bit when, when I get to the what what happened during that time when I was scared. Th there was, you know, periods of time where the lab information was not quite connected up properly, and so we were getting missed, dropped lab tests. Um, you you do need to set up specific mechanisms to help monitor to monitor those. Uh, Sasha, do you want to answer uh, ask a question? Yes, <clears throat> yes. So um, I was thinking of I don't know if you know Corinne Hall. She has she's uh, an emerge doc in BC who's interested in adverse drug events, and she has in her research she showed some things that I think people wouldn't surprise people that. People who present to the emergency department and may be admitted with adverse drug events um, are often, it's it's often preventable and often repeated, unfortunately, that this, the person after their hospital stay or the emerge visit goes back and somehow the pharmacies don't know or they change pharmacies maybe, or the family doctor doesn't know the details. And so part of her mission is to, um, communicate like like communicate those those things that aren't within our institute her institution but but could be so i'm just wondering can, can you have you thought about that and um could that be something that that someday our institution could have yeah i mean i would say that ultimately having that system like whole patient view whether they're in the hospital or not is is really the critical the critical goal um, you, you know, the documentation of medications uh, is one of the most difficult tasks we have in, in healthcare in the sense of, uh, I mean, it's not technically difficult, but it's, it's, it's time consuming and uh, requires a, a very focused attention to detail. 
uh, and, and often following up with a lot of different people and, and, and you know, pe- professionals in different settings. Um, certainly having a, a, a place to document the, the version of the truth is, is really critical. Um, the second part of that is not just documenting it, but making it available for people to see um, and interact with. So, you know, the patient portal that we have, the patients put their own, they can put their own medications there, you know, outside the context of an acute uh, visit. Um, we built some other functionality to connect with the community providers. We're going to be testing that out, like the, the community pharmacists uh, directly, so we can do e-prescribing. Um, and that would, again, lead to updates in the system. I think thinking about that world where if you order the doctor in the clinic, it, it, it gets immediately propagated to everybody uh, who's involved in that circle of care for that patient, I think is really a critical piece. So I definitely, Sasha, I do see that coming. Um, Ingrid's asked, Perhaps in today's context, the strongest business argument is that you could deliver care with less people. I, I would say that's absolutely true. Um, and maybe maybe what we what I would provoke and maybe ask everyone here to think about is like, what would you do, need to do to take advantage of that? Um, because it's, it's one thing to have the tool that allows the distributed care uh, to do the virtual care, to do the monitoring from remotely, to engage patients in their care more directly. But oftentimes those things don't happen because there's other drivers to keep those things in place. So I would I would ask, uh, I agree with Ingrid that that's a very strong uh, business case. And we saw that benefit happen with when, when we implemented Epic. Um, Eric Tremblay says, does your EMR allow us to identify patients who are not on track on target? So the, you know, the, the tracking of perhaps some quality indicators related to cardiovascular risk factors as an example. Um, and so, yes, it does. And uh, so, you, you know, there's this uh, one of, and then that's one of the strengths of Epic is that, that they promote is that, that it has that ability to do population health management. Um, and, and I would just say that that's something that I would pay a lot of attention to. And I would say that that's one of the biggest opportunities uh, as an academic health science center. Uh, my sense is that you're at the hub of, of a lot of different patient populations where you're looking after them. Uh, and, and what I would say is high risk patient populations. Well, and what I mean by high risk is those who are at high risk of having a, a deterioration in their health, uh, which will then you know, have an, a negative impact on their well being, their productivity, have a negative impact on the health system further. And I think you're in a, a very strong position to take a leadership position and, and should put yourself out there uh, in collaboration with your public health department and the ministry. But I think it would be something that would be extremely beneficial for society. Um, how would you how would you have reacted in one of the contexts of your had, had, had cancer? You know, that's being shown. I would have been actually, I would have obviously been very upset, um, but at least I would have been able to know about it and act on it. I mean, the alternative would be that I wouldn't have known and that perhaps it got lost to follow up and didn't get communicated to the family doctor and 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 not acted upon. So I think that would be something that uh, you know, Charles, I, I obviously <laughs> I wouldn't have been very happy, but it, on the on the flip side, it, it, it is the truth, right? Like, you, you, you know, uh, you've got to deal with the truth when it comes available. And I think most patients, and there's been lots of studies on this, that, that patients and families need, need that information. And they can, you know, it, it's not like, um, it's, it's not like Jack Nicholson in, in uh, all, all the Right Men or whatever it was, when, when you, know, you can't handle the truth. It, it, you know, patients and families can handle the truth. Um, let me move on in my slides and, and I'm, I'll, I'll come back and ask you some more questions in a moment. So, so we we this is a long journey, and I, I don't want people to think that this is something that you can just buy a machine, and then your your whole culture changes. It, it's not like that. Um, and we've been on the journey for you know a good twenty years um, at our hospital, and I've had the luck the the, the luck and, and the privilege of being part of that team that's supported supported this. Um, I, I would just say. Um, that it, it isn't, you can accelerate some of this. I think we, we did things a certain way uh, and we learned along the way that, uh, that uh, you know, if I was advising people, I would, and if I was gonna do it again myself, I think I would do things slightly different, but but I, there are four distinct eras and, and we're moving into the fifth distinct era. And, and and so I just thought I would just kind of highlight some of these. And, and, and these are, the first one is building our data warehouse. And that was a, a repository. We had, like you, we had Oasis. Um, as a corporate uh, uh, clinical information system. Uh, and 
in 20, 2005, we built, we, we finished building our data warehouse. Uh, in 2009, like between 2005 and nine, we were really like a small group of us were mining the data, doing research projects. Um, in 2009, we, we, we pivoted and, and started using that as a, a core platform to support quality management at, at the corporate level, um, as well as continuing on with our research agenda. In 2019, it is when we went to Epic and that kind of changed everything. Um, and and then now we're in the post uh, post I don't know what we'll call it the post 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 epic like we're in a new a new era and I'll I'll talk about that in a moment. So so as I said like in 2020, 2000, like in the early two thousands we got this big grant from C F Canon Foundation for Innovation to build a data warehouse. Uh, on the left you see all of the systems we we implemented. You see this extract, transform, and load uh, function, and that's like. When you say you're building a data warehouse, that's the software you build that takes the data that you want out of the systems that you had and puts it into the data warehouse in the way you want it to be in the data warehouse. And basically you're loading it up into the data warehouse in a way that you make uh, inconsistent data more consistent. Um, and you build what, what are called, um, what are called sub you can build subject data marks, which are like, you know, specific subsets of the data that are you know, related to a particular topic area. It might be, for example, on diagnoses or on bed utilization or on OR utilization, for example. Um, you can also, uh, you, you also typically build something called metadata. And metadata is actually probably one of the most important things you do, even though uh, most non-technical people don't really care about it. Uh, and the reason why it's the most important thing is because it tells the, it, it, this is data about data. So every time you bring data over from your source systems, you, you then have this now this this like a description of that data and what it means where there might be problems with it and that's actually very important for an organization so that they uh, are able to uh, that any user in, in in the institution can say what data do we have and how good is that data um, and that that's relevant to pretty much anyone who wants to use data and if at, at times you know like people don't want to look at that they just want to give me the answer but but others like the analysts of the world really want to understand where the data are coming from so they that they can be they can have you know they can communicate some confidence in the results of the analysis and then you know we we built these um uh access rules like and i have to say when i started and this is like where i i kind of found it difficult as a like as a researcher i was all i cared about was hooking up my sas to this data warehouse then using sas to do my my analysis uh, but what I realized is that we needed to have a set of rules for access to this. And I was just, I just, although I, I'd gotten the grant to build it, I was essentially just another user out there. And so we had to build up a, a mechanism by which people could uh, ethically access the data um, in a way that was acceptable to our society. And so that was a bit of work. And, and to make that possible, we built a, a, a layer between the users and the data to make sure that privacy was uh, managed. So that, that was era one of uh, building it. And what, 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 what we all learned in that situation, and maybe you already know this, uh, healthcare data is messy and poorly organized. E even where you thought things would be very easy to analyze it, they, they weren't. Um, there's, um, and you know, I can remember things like looking at, at, at how gender was coded. Uh, you know, it was coded probably about 30 different ways in, in different databases and different approaches. And, 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 and I would just say that there was like, and there was also different eras within the same database where you saw things change. And, and so like, how do you go and analyze that without a lot of work? Um, and the, sec the second lesson learned was really around things like how, like if you don't have a centralized mechanism to do this, you're going to waste a lot of time uh, because everyone's gonna be fixing those errors, errors their own way uh, at different times. So. Let's say an analyst team works to, to sort of standardize the way we're going to report or evaluate on gender using all that complicated 30 ways that I talked about into a single way. Well, if you have two teams doing that, that's two times the work for sure. But it's actually probably more than two times the work because it's very likely that those teams will make different, different decisions about how they code it. And so you've actually now more than doubled the work. Whereas if you have a single team who's responsible and gets the right buy-in to do it, do it once, do it well, and then document it, then that now becomes the standard and people can use it. 
Um, and people can always manage the standard and change it, but without having having that single group responsible, it's it's almost uh, you, you know you're going to waste time and effort. Um, the, the, the third part was privacy and security, which I alluded to, um, is manageable, but require, requires leadership and investment. And our main problem was that we had limited uh, resources at that front end for people to access the data. Uh, but the privacy laws said that, you know, not everyone could get in those front doors. So we had to come up with an approach which required managing the expectations, which is really the leadership piece. And the investment, which is getting the, the people in place to, to help manage it and, and make it happen, which was the, the investment part. So era two, which I'll try and go through very quickly, um, is our mining. Oh, and, and I'll just say one thing, like in reflection, if we go forward to the EMR piece of the conference, uh, this issue of these issues start to get better and, and less of a problem if you have one single system. Um, I heard, I heard uh, someone tell a story today where uh, you guys, I think uh, Emily said that the, the residents right now will start writing their note in Word and then copy and pasting it into the Oasis because they, they have no confidence that Oasis is not going to crash before they finish their clinical note. Well, well, that creates actually a whole bunch of difficulty, right? And that creates difficulty in a number of different levels. Um, and there's there may be all sorts of different workarounds which are leading to different data infrastructure which then makes it very difficult, much more difficult to uh, manage this, uh, this comprehensive single view of the truth. Uh, the mining the data, this is the second era. This is where we, you know, we built it and, and they will come kind of thing. And, uh, you know, we were very successful. We got lots of papers out, um, myself and a few colleagues who were really the kind of owners of the grant uh, we we were doing a, a bunch of work. You see some of the, the, the abstracts here. Uh, it was fun. It was like very easy to. Um, it was it was very easy to to do intellectual work to to understand cause and effect relationships and and look at what others had done and, and put this forward. And actually, it was also very easy to engage with other researchers, whether they be in Ottawa or elsewhere, uh, because you know sharing the lessons learned was really exciting for people. Um, but I would say that there was always a bit of um, um, uh, frustration. Uh, and, and, and here's what the frustration was. There was a few of us who had access to data and not and many people out there who wanted access to the data. Um, it was difficult to, to get people uh, to get people to uh, be in the, in it with the right level of training and uh, right level of security control uh, to be actually able to do it. And that was really, and, and it was both the security and, and also the, the technical capabilities. And, and we started a university course to teach people both of those things. Uh, people quit the course like after two classes. I don't know if it was my teaching ability or the content. I'll, I'll put it on my colleague, Dr. Van Walraven's teaching capability. But, but the bottom line is it wasn't like it's, to, you know, learning to, to code SAS and learning to code, you know, soft uh, database languages it's not, it's not something they, they teach you uh, in, in grade school. Like there's a lot, to, a lot to learn there. It's, it's tricky and it takes a lot of practice and, and not everyone is willing to put the practice in, 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 in and want to do it. So, but then on the flip side, getting the access to people is, is like, is frustrating uh, for those people, those same people, because they, they, they actually want the data. Um, the, there's a conflation of data and quality. I used to have people coming to me saying, you know, I'm being told to, to improve quality. I, I therefore need data. And they sometimes thought that, and, you know, I would notice uh, like we get them the data and then nothing would happen. Um, no, no improvement efforts, no, no, not really no insights were being driven by the quality, the data. Um, and so it was like, in my mind, we were coming up with, um, uh, you know, there would seem to be this anxiety to improve quality and not a pathway for people to improve quality. Um, and and they, they felt there was a mis there was a misdirection towards just just getting the data with what it was all about, um, and, and and I think that was that taught us really we needed to to invest in some of those learning systems I just talked about how we would help help people people do quality improvement and leadership, and then the third the third uh, lesson learned is really around efforts do not necessarily follow important findings. We were finding really important things, and it was really hit or miss whether administration or physicians or uh, what I would say, maybe the, the, the industry more broadly 
would would follow up and it was it got kind of frustrating when you find things that that it is like very important from a quality point of view and people it, it, they're not able to adapt it and you're not able to help make it adaptable um and so i would just say and i saw that happening a lot um with a lot of my colleagues and and so we felt well we need to do more than that um and this is where we moved into era three which was quality management at the hospital um and on the quality management side this is where we this is where we took a more comprehensive view to quality management and said, okay, data is one part of this. We said, you know, ultimately we have at the top of the organization, we have to articulate priorities, which, which can be translated into me measurable goals. Uh, then we have our, we have our culture, which is really around things like our just culture, how we work uh, collaboratively in teams, how we're, we're aiming to always improve um, and where we're going to view our improvement efforts as experimentation uh, in which we continually try to drive towards better outcomes. We, we have our we have our organization and how we organized around our quality mandate uh, versus uh, and and that included like embedding this very much within operations and having a dyad relationship between the physicians and the uh, administration. So they working very uh, closely with each other. Um, this also included us putting in place incentive systems for physicians to be involved in quality. Um, and then, and then we have our measurement system, which I've talked about, which is, but, but with this, really what the, the tangible difference was, we built a, a, a business intelligence tool and platform, which was aligned to our priorities and our organizational structure, which then allowed accountability to be seen for outcomes. And that allowed people then to become more engaged in quality. And then lastly, we had our improvement methodology, which was something we developed, which was called the TOH innovation framework. And, and we're te we taught, started teaching that to all of our staff and physicians. We've now got about 2,000 people taught in that improvement methodology. And we see people using that now in all of their, their quality improvement work. And, and we had some great outcomes. Uh, we, you know, we, we increased our patient experience at the corporate level. We, 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 we reduced our, our patient our readmission rates. We, we, we increased the number of people being treated and decreased their, our overall spend. Uh, we, we, we reduced our, our mortality ratio by 20%. And then we, we also saw our, our uh, physician and staff engagement improve. And this was happening at a time when in many uh, parts of the country, uh, the, the opposite was happening. And, and, and really what I would just say here is, this is not because we had a comprehensive EMR. This was because we had, uh, I would say, because we had a quality management system in place. And and I would almost say that, that like we, we had built the, the fundamental components of that learning health system that I alluded to, where we had the data being made available through our data warehouse and data platform. We had built that knowledge, uh, the data to knowledge functions through these communities of practice and, and, and the co-leadership with administration and, and physicians working together. And then we built in incentives and capabilities around quality improvement. So taking that knowledge to action. Um, and I would say that 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 but that's going to be requiring like full leadership commitment. It's not buying a platform. It's it's really working collaboratively towards a goal. I would say that absolutely having an information system to guide it is very critical. And when you buy Epic or an EMR, you then start to have a platform where you can actually it becomes almost easier to manage behaviors as well as manage the data. Um, the 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 second really big lesson learned is. Um, when, when you work carefully with both the leaders and the front line, you can start to come un, you get much better understandings of where the gaps are uh, and where you've got opportunities related to um, changing behavior. And in that way, you're in a much better position to take advantage of like, how do you create the internal capability of people, the internal motivation for change? How do you create skills and, and create time for people to do it? How do you create incentives that help people change? We, 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 we created an incentive system for physicians to get involved in quality, which involved this very small amount of money, but had a, a profound impact. And I think it was largely because it was driven towards a very specific uh, tactic that uh, and, and created some very specific opportunities. And then, and as I said, like the key lesson around data, it's an ingredient, but much more is required. And, and I would say like, if you're working towards a um, EMR buy, you can start working towards this, this quality management system um, in, in advance. So, so era four um, occurred when we bought Epic. As you can see by this, it blew up our, our, our data warehouse uh, build because uh, Epic 
was no longer connected we, and, unless we build this, like unless we rebuilt it. But it didn't make sense for us to rebuild it because it was, um, because it was, uh, it came with its own data warehouse. Our data warehouse was getting a bit old by this point and had old technologies using it. And so we thought, well, let's let's like take a relook at this and whether there's a new platform. Um, part of the reason, this is part of the reason why I was so stressed out because our ability to monitor the system went kind of out the window for a short period of time after Epic uh, was put in. It took us about a month and a half after we went live so that we had good system data. Um, and that was a bit, that was very stressful if you're running the system and running the operations, relying largely on anecdote. Um, so why why is Epic not enough? And, and 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 like so this this process like I've I've sold you hopefully a little bit on Epic and its benefits like it is tremendously powerful, but but it's not enough. And you need to like I've talked about the benefits of that quality management system. One of the things I found was that the when we implemented this and everyone was going through this change, right? Like the change of going through Epic, people became so fixated on Epic and less focused on their other parts of their tasks. So, you know, their relationships with people that, that includes patients and colleagues, their relationships with themselves, people were staying at work till late trying to figure out how to use it. You know, that change was very difficult. And so you do need to think about how you support people through that. Um, so, and you do have to think about how you create this quality management system around it. And it, it, it changes it a bit because of, of the way Epic's structured. But there's there's other pieces about Epic that I think are worth mentioning. One is there's, there's only clinical data in it. Um, and so you're gonna wanna bring in research data. You're gonna wanna bring in certain types of lab data perhaps that aren't captured routinely in, in your LIS. There's, there's, there's pieces of information. There's case costing data, financial data, payroll data, um, scheduling data for your workforce. Like there's a, uh, there may be patient reported outcome measure data that you want to bring in. So, so you're going to need to think about strategies for bringing this data in. Um, when we went live with Epic, uh, you know, we turned it on in 2019, but we had 20, we had 20 years of data in our data warehouse. And, you, you know, from the minute you start collecting data, like if you look after a rare disease, you're not going to get much observations. It's going to take you a few years before you start getting any, any sort of sample sizes. Um, the self-service tools for data access are, are restrictive and not particularly useful. Um, there's knowledge management challenges, like, like it's very complicated. Um, managing data access for multiple organizations can be tricky if that's what you choose to do. And then, you know, bringing data from other sources can be counting. So we, we, we've, we recognize that there is a need and it took us about 18 months or so, two years. And, and part of that's a bit protracted because of the COVID pandemic uh, to come up with a new, a new approach. And so here's our lessons learned for this for this period. One is that Epic offers amazing benefits, however, except that the first year will be a, a, a difficult adjustment time for your workforce. Um, and there should be reasonable expectations for the improvement work you do around it. And you should be focused on specific things that can, can influence success at a high level, patient safety, patient flow, staff wellness. And you need to do a lot, more than you would expect and, and more than you plan. Uh, to support the front line of training. I, I would say a second thing that's really critical is to establish functional objectives. And that means things like, I'm going to reduce hospital length of stay, or I'm going to uh, make it you know, easier to uh, do best, best possible medication histories and, and AMR. I'm going to do you know, whatever functions you have and make sure they're clearly defined with clear objectives and measures and, and tied to corporate strategy and then use those to, to drive priority setting because you, you get lost in all the all the opportunity and all the, all the stuff that's hitting you. And then the last thing is, is establish an information governance program. And, and this is one where I think you tie it to that um, broader learning health system uh, framework that I talked about. And so the last thing I'll talk about before I stop, and I'm, I'm trying to get through this quick, is, is era five. And, and we're just starting era five, which is uh, where we're really getting to this new democratization uh, of, of data, and I would say system ownership. Um, and really what we're talking about here is when we get to a point where, like, you no longer have to line up behind that quality, that data analyst to get your data. Uh, behind all those researchers who have the big grants or behind all those administrators who have those operational needs, that there is a, a platform that's built for someone who's managing quality, someone who has a clinical question and wants to do a research project but doesn't have a grant. 
there's a mechanism by which people can engage with data uh, and, and, and participate in discussions and conversations that will ensue from accessing that data. And, and it's, I think it's critical. I think it, it, it's a very important engagement piece for our staff. And, you know, if, if, if people have access to the data, they're going to then lead to improving the quality of data. That's going to lead to improved generation of knowledge and, and, and spread it amongst the workforce. It's going to improve, it's going to improve our actions to do quality improvement. And, and for us at the Ottawa Hospital, we, we view this in terms of a platform. Uh, we've we've um, acquired MD Clone, which uh, it, I feel is going to transform this work. I, I view that there's also working with people and, and so training people how to use it, training people what to do with it after they access the data. And then part, creating partnerships is the third piece. And, and really, this is like, how do we partner with like institutions like McGill or with uh, Sheba Medical Center or with with people in, you know, maybe at, at, in, God forbid, in Toronto, um, the, the idea is that we work for with people across our, our ecosystems to try and come up with ideas. It could also mean partnering with private sector, you know, pharmaceutical companies or, or medical device companies or others who might also participate in, in our improving our system. And the goal is that we have more collaboration, we have better data quality, better decisions, and then ultimately achievement in the quadruple aim. And so I won't spend too much time on MD Clone other than to say it. it it, it allows non-data scientists to access data because it takes advantage of, of, a, of a longitudinal data structure, a knowledge management structure, but also it creates synthetic data on the fly, which is which is fake data about fake people, but it actually has the same statistical properties as the original data. And, and there is an ability to go from the synthetic data back to the original data. So it, it really does completely transform data access because you don't have to worry about personal health information, you're, you're dealing with fake data but you're getting the, the same insights you would with if you use the real data. And we, we built this, we used this uh, this MD clone platform to build a course. We we worked with our Ministry of Labor because they want to transform the workforce and they recognize that, you know, if we want to make health informatics and health uh, health innovation as, a, as an ecosystem play, we, we need to build training programs to help people transition their careers. And so they, they funded us to create this course uh, happy to actually share it with you guys here in McGill because maybe I know you guys are are, are trying to use MD Clone, so maybe this would be something where, you know, we could share our our our, our learnings and our platform with you on that. Um, and and then and then moving beyond the platform, it's like how are we going to work together? And this is this kind of this concept, and MD Clone is promoting this and building their software specifically to support it, where we where there's a uh, within a healthcare institution, you have a center of excellence. Where really at the center you've got the 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 deep methodological expertise related to the data. You've got the policy development. So like what are the rules, the system administration, uh, provisioning people to access the system, etc. Uh, making sure that data we're bringing into the database is consistent with corporate priorities, uh, and we have funding mechanisms for those. Um, supporting connections with global or uh, national partners so who are who are doing similar work. And then developing training, keep development for developing training for the people who are going to be using the platform. And then the spokes really get into like where we have the, the brains of the organization. So, you know, you know, for example, we might have a cancer spoke where we would have uh, deep content expertise. We'd have the biomedical, the bioinformatics team, uh, you know, linking, linking our, uh, you know, our genetic oncology, our oncology, like our genetic data with our, our, our phenotype data. Um, we would have, um, a group of researchers working with industry for perhaps looking at, at, at uh, opportunities to, uh, to do innovation. Um, we would have uh, quality improvement efforts to look at where, how, how, you know, how we can improve access to the clinics, how we would provide you know, symptom management, uh, you know, and other, other types of, of, of real world problems. Um, and then we would also in that have embedded within that, that group we would have teams who could then communicate back to our center of excellence and say, okay, here's how the application's working. Here's what we need to do to improve. Um, and then the other part about the spokes is, you know, why couldn't that cancer group at the Ottawa hospital work with the cancer group here at the, at the, at the MUHC or with the cancer group at Sheba and, and now start, instead of having a, a sort of catchment area of one or 2 million, you start having a catchment area. If you put it all together, you start talking about three, four, five million. And if we, the more centers we add, we can have even even more. So that's kind of where we're going right now. Um, and I'll just finish by saying, you know, ultimately the learning health system is is a as I said a socio technical uh, system. 
Uh, it takes a lot to make it happen. Data is one piece. The data come out of the EMR. And I would just finish by saying that having an EMR makes all of this possible. Without having an EMR, a comprehensive hospital information system, you can't really do anything. It's the, it, it is really literally the, 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 um, the price of admission. So I know I kind of whipped through some of that fairly quickly and I didn't have a lot of, I, I did pause for some questions in a minute. I've got, I've got some comments here. Sasha's asked another question. She would like to hear more about incentives I mentioned. Um, and so I'll tell you what, and, and then also the improvement method. And, and so for the incentives we had at, at the Ottawa hospital, we had a, something called the, the Ottawa hospital academic medical organization. And that managed our provincial alternative funding plan which was really a way to correct for um, inequity at the teaching hospitals for, you know, like in the community, they're seeing all sorts of like, uh, like uh, the often perception, they're seeing, you know, the easier cases and leaving the more complex cases at the teaching hospital. And similarly, the teaching hospital were, were, were you know, got the three part mission of teaching education and research for which there's no, no income for the, the, the education and research per se. So the AFP was meant to correct that. And, and our, team what they did is they divided that 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 contribution into three you know eight 40 percent for research 40 percent for education and 20 percent for uh, cl clinical quality and then and then as a as a board the academic medical organization decided to hold back a portion of that quality quality funding to the departments uh, and basically they in, unless the departments actually fulfilled a number of quality improvement uh, tasks and functions. Um, and um, again, I mean, we've, so there's been a couple of publications on this now. Uh, it had a profound impact. It got a lot of people engaged. It gave the quality leaders, like the physician quality leaders, a voice and, and, and a position at the table and, and got the department and division heads really sort of promoting and getting behind quality, um, which they wanted to do anyway. So what it did is it allowed to give them a platform that made it meaningful when they had the conversations when people didn't follow through. In terms of the improvement method of teaching, uh, Sasha, what we did there was we, we had in our institution, we had a whole bunch of people that were doing Lean and Six Sigma. There was another group that went off and did like the model for improvement that the IHI teaches. Uh, and then there was a, th a fourth group doing like the uh, comprehensive unit-based safety program. All of them had very different methods and it became very difficult for our, our operations leaders and uh, our quality team and our, our data analytics team to help support. So what our quality team did is they said, okay, look, we've come up with the Ottawa Hospital Innovation Framework. Um, again, we've published on this. Uh, we, we, we've been using it now. And basically what we did is we lined up all those other methods and said, look, it actually lines up into a pretty easy, into a pretty easy pathway. It's, you know, to def define the problem. What is the problem? And then we, what we did is we, linked a whole bunch of like quality improvement tools to that step defining the problem. Then we have analyzed, analyzed the situation and, uh, and that's really getting to the root cause and doing really formal root cause analysis of what the, the quality problem is. The, th the third step is test and trial solutions. Um, the, the fourth step is, is hardwire the, hardwire the, um, the final prototype. And then the last is scale and, and spread. And so, those are our, our, our methods, um, and, and again, with each of those five steps, there's a uh, there's a set of tools that we built, and then what, so now we teach that in our courses. But we've also made a SharePoint site where we use we we actually have the information all there and, and guidance documents, but all those steps, those tools that, that the clinicians are using are all embedded and, and available. Uh, Ab Abhinav, uh, what have been some of the tangible benefits from accessing data? Um, we're using data from Shiba. Shiba. Uh, no, no we, we've been using our own data. So like as a trial, what we did is we brought our historical data warehouse and loaded up into MD clone. So that means we have that 20 years of data. Um, we're now, we've now brought, we're bringing the Epic data in now. So as of like January, we're gonna have like continuous data from 2000 all the way up to the present. Um, the, you know, a couple of tangible benefits, like actually one of the ones was, led by a, a recruit Mark brought in, who he tried to steal back over to Montreal was uh, Dr. Johnny Mack. Um, and he did a work on, he's, he's a transfusion uh, you know, specialist. And, and so he was looking at you know, perioperative anemia 
And we looked at the cost and health consequences of, of preoperative anemia and the benefits of uh, perioperative uh, transfusions uh, and saw significant gaps. And then we've worked with our, our clinical, um, clinical teams to build up sort of more standard processes for, um, for ensuring people's anemia is corrected preoperatively. Um, uh, yeah, so I've answered both. Ava asked roughly how much money is involved in this protected envelope. Um, well, so, you know, it cost, I think about $140, $150 million for the in, in implementation. That, that was about five years ago. So I'm sure there's inflation going on there if you want to do something of similar size. Um, that was for the Epic install, but, but it's hard to say, like, you know, all of the things I've talked about, like people get behind it, right? Like people get behind it and they do things differently. And so you don't always, you know, like just, if I change how I do my work, it's, it's not actually costing me anymore. It's costing me the same amount. Like I, I unless I work longer days, which I refuse to do at this stage of my career. I mean, I, I, I do work probably harder and most of us work probably harder than we should. But the idea is that uh, there's only so much time in the day. And so if we change from job A to job B, it's not really costing you anymore. Um, it may cost you a little bit to change, but once you get to that new routine, it's not it's not costing you more. Um, we actually found that there was significant savings and benefits from this. I told you, we, we, we were able to reduce our spending uh, at our institution level by about 15%. And you know, on a $1.7 billion operation, that's a lot of money. We were at the same time seeing 15% more patients. Uh, so that's like that was a pretty cool transformation that we saw. Um, if you think about population health, I mean that's that's cool. And I would I would say that you know as I said, like people, some people are uh, found it challenging those changes and, and left, and but most people really enjoyed it and and, and thrived in it. Um, uh, okay. Um, there's detail, yeah. So this is like my Sasha. This is my learning over my career. I, I'll write a book, maybe. That's what I'll do. Um, uh, we'll need to close the round in three minutes. Okay. Do you want to hand over, <laughs> Nadia? Like, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think because we, we do have to close the rounds, what I'm going to add, first of all, thank you. Really outstanding presentation. Uh, uh, you know, needless to say, we are really far behind and, and there, we've learned a lot from your presentation. And I do hope that uh, you, you can stay on for a few minutes so people can maybe enter some of their final questions in the chat. It is very impressive what you're doing. First of all, congratulations for accomplishing accomplishing so much. Maybe there's, you know, one minute left. Question for you. You've had a chance to meet this morning many of our administrators. You know what we are currently doing. What would you say for the MUHC is the next step? Do we do this from the ground up or top down? In other words, do we wait for the government, the provincial government, to tell us this is the database that's going to be, you know, you know used throughout Quebec? Or do we say, you know what, this is never going to happen, we have to build this up and we just sort of purchase our own database. Can I just have your opinion in, 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 in one minute, where should we go at the MUHC? You're going to get the Ontarian to get thrown under the bus here on this, is that what you're asking? So, so I would, I would just say is I would be cautious about going against the direction of your provincial government, that's one thing. Um, but I would, I would say that... Um, one one thing I think that's lost in this is the voice of the patients. And I, I, I think that my recommendation would be to ensure that the public and patients know the impact of the system that they're dealing with right now, which is which is inefficient, um, which which leads to uh, errors, and which is basically invisible and opaque to the patients. And and I think if if people knew what that meant for their care, like in terms of the medical errors that happen, in terms of like the wasted energy, like the brain energy that the clinicians are having to expend in, in trying to find and track down information. Um, in addition to the fact that patients themselves, like it's completely unpatient centered, like they call to get help and they don't know where to get help and they don't get, they don't get the, the information out of the system. Like if patients knew that this was a decision that could be made and solved and that there are solutions that have been, it's it's not complicated. Like there's many places in the world that have gone fully electronic without 
at, at populations the size of Quebec. I, I think in, in many ways it's scandalous, I would say. Like it, it is, and, and I think that as long as you look inward to your hospital and inward to, to your, pop, your, your profession, I think you lose a lot of opportunity. My sense is if you go look outwards to the broader community and the patients you serve and the, and the city that you're such an important part of, then I think like the, the, the business case becomes so important. And, and so you won't have to be the one selling it. I, I would think that it would become up to, up to the, up to that. Uh, uh, others will be wanting to, to, to solve the problem. And I, I, you've got to figure out how to do that responsibly in a way that doesn't come across as self-serving. And, and if you do that, you will succeed and you won't get the government mad at you because the government will want to do it because it's the right thing to do. Well, thank you very much. That is really, a, you know, <laughs> we just received a thanks for the piece of advice, Dr. Forster, from our, our, our Director General, Dr. Feller. Mark, uh, we have to close the rounds. Do you want to say a final word? Thank you so much, Dr. Forster. Mark, yeah. uh, do you want to just say a final word before we yeah. close this out? Yeah, absolutely. Again, just on a, on a personal note, uh, it, it's uh, fantastic uh, to, to have uh, Alan, Dr. Forster, uh, join us uh, on, on this very important topic, really that touches all facets of uh, life here at the MUHC. And as, uh, as Dr. Forster so eloquently put, uh, 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 you know, it, it is, is, is part of any patient care imperative. So, so thanks again, Al. And, and I think uh, Dr. Forster will stick around uh, for a few questions uh, for those that uh, would like to uh, put in questions in the chat or open up the mic, but uh, we'll uh, release everybody else. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thanks again, Dr. Forster, for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Nadia. Thanks. So I don't know if there's some unanswered questions in the chat. I had a few. Okay, Ariane, go ahead, please. Or with Sasha? Or, yeah, was, or no, Ariane uh, has her hand Arianne's up. Ariane's got her hand okay, up. Okay, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Sasha, and then we'll go to Ariane. Oh, Ariane, go first because, yeah, you go first. And you're oh, muted. You're muted. Yeah, thank you so much. It's, it's nice to uh, hear you talk. Uh, I spent a lot of time with David Bates and so indirectly heard a lot about what you've been doing in Canada. So thank you, that was really enlightening. Um, you know, we have a lot, a lot, a lot of work to do here, I think. We have a big challenge, and I think one of the exciting challenges is that we actually have data that crosses the lifespan. So you know, we're linked to the pediatric hospital, and our database, our data warehouse right now does contain uh, data from the children's as well. So you know, I'm, I'm starting to look at some of that data for specific conditions where we might have lifespan data. And I think the MD clone uh, can be very interesting in that regard. My question was, did you, you know, in terms of translating the, you know, the, the technical piece to the quality piece, were you able to actually insert or include quality measures and decision support in your system. So that's something that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at working at one of the ACC databases. And I just wondered if you were successful in implementing it and then sustaining it so that people constantly, um, you know, had feedback on the quality measures that they were looking at and then were able to adjust their medical behavior and decision-making. Right. Yeah. So yes, we have, but probably not to the extent that we want to do is maybe the quick answer. And that, that's why it's really important to align with the priorities of the organization. If, if it's because there's so many competing priorities for the time and attention of the small technical team that's available. And, right. and so you do, you do, unfortunately, without a, you know, in, in many ways, like those resources have to be to a certain extent centrally managed. And, and so you need to build a, a mechanism for that central team to hear uh, and, and communicate with the, with the sort of the, the more, I guess, maybe the distal parts of the system that are, are, are doing the actual work. Um, and, and 
And, you know, Mark, Mark lived in it as a division head. So he can say like, whether I'm, you know, but like, whether, you know, it was, if, if what we did is we focused in on like, let's say patient experience was, that was a big deal for our okay. executive team and, and, and for our corporation. So we spent a lot of time getting the patient experience data at, um, you know, mapped, like brought into the system and then mapped to our, our, our hierarchies. So to the physician hierarchy, which included the reporting through and to the operational hierarchy, like through the, 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 the VPs, directors, the managers, frontline. And so we took the, we, we had those two frameworks. One was our patient experience framework and, and our measurements. And then the other was our hierarchies for, for, um, you know, for, for, for accountability. And then by having the two, you can start doing the, like looking across and, and then once we kind of moved on from patient experience, we started looking at cost, let's say. And then we looked at the indicators of cost and we had a threshold of cost where it became inefficient. And so then we could, again, map inefficient care to those same hierarchies. Now, if you wanted to get to more clinical processes, uh, some groups were really interested in utilization of lab tests or utilization of imaging tests. And so again, we built indicators related to those. But those were really like, not disease specific indicators they were more corporate okay. indicators and and i would say like where i would think by having a um more distributed model like which is what's going to happen with md clone that gives more tools to the frontline people to build an indicator that means much more to them as a in their ex specific work experience right like so you know the neonatal icu could build a indicators that are really okay. relevant to their practice um, or, or, or the, or, 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 or the, you know, the thrombosis doctors could build a doc, like something that's relevant to them. And, right. and then, and therefore you can build, build a tool that's meaningful. And, and if it, if it works and it shows benefit, you can engage your own clinicians. And that's that idea of those central, those decentralized groups uh, in that yeah. center that, that, I, that we're looking to build. And there's a real opportunity there for sharing quality measures between institutions, right? Because developing them is very time consuming. And so it would I would imagine that if you wanted to sort of create like a little mini quality network, you could actually share some of the quality measures that you develop that are not disease specific with some other measures, for example, that we might be developing that are disease specific. Well, so that's the... Um... Adams, what Adams stands for, and why I call it the Adams Center, it comes from ask, discover, act, and measure, and and then share. The S, the last S right. is share. Right. And so, the, the the founder's vision is that if you're working in a particular area, you define your query using the the MD clone platform. That is something that you can replicate anywhere, right? It's so it becomes now an app, and and your intervention to improve quality can become part of that app. Um, and then that can be shared across the network, whether you are, you know, other hospitals that you're involved in. So you're right. That's exactly the visionary. And that's exactly what, uh, what the founder of, of MD Clone is trying to drive towards. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Ingrid? Yes, I actually, um, not a question, but a comment. And I'm, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to address that to Dr. Roger. Please don't leave. Um, <laughs> Sorry. So I was wondering if uh, as a practical uh, strategy, it might be useful to partner with oncology and see if the Rossi Cancer Network might be interested in funding some of the background work necessary to uh, move the levers on this kind of a transition. It has the advantage already of being a structure that's in place. It's not limited to the MUHC. Uh, I think it would be possible then to uh, reach out to francophone uh, partners. Um, the other thing is, I think anything to do with cancer care is especially on people's radar. And especially since there is recently published, you know, the regional disparities uh, about delivery in cancer care. So... Maybe you can't do it all at once, but this might be a way to at least get started and show the value of what has been discussed today. I, I would agree, Ingrid, that finding those examples is the way to go. Um, and uh, I like your cat. And um, I think we should, uh, like, that's something to explore. That's definitely something to explore. 
And the more communities are involved in pushing for this, the more likely it is that it's actually going to happen and, and deliver benefits. I'm sorry, I've got to get Dr. Forster off to a, another meeting. Uh, apologies uh, to, to everybody. Thanks so much again for, for Come back again. Take care, Sasha. Okay, bye. <laughs>